Good morning. Well, it's not morning anymore. It's 10 after 12. It was morning when I sat down to pull out my notes <laughs> or my my scripture here uh, and to go over it before we started. But it's, uh, it's afternoon. I had morning meetings. And again, I just couldn't get up in time. I'll blame it on the cold. It was 28 here this morning. And uh, we haven't turned the heat on in the house yet. So I was moving a little slow. It took until about 9.30 or 10 for my, for my oil to start circulating properly. And, you know, I, sometimes you got to let an engine run for a while before you pull out of the driveway. But, uh, no, I had a meeting at 7.30, had another meeting at 9.30, and I just did not have time this morning. But I'm still on point, and I still have enough brains left to do our lesson today. Beginning in Chapter 2 of Zechariah, Go back to verse uh, the, the part that we finished with yesterday in chapter 6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord a host, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that touched you toucheth the apple of his eye. Yes. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and they shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Now, we're going to go into verse 10. And this is partially a quotation of the book of Zephaniah. And I will take you back there in a minute. Zephaniah uh, preached at least three centuries before Zechariah did. They, but names both start with the Z, but they were several hundred years apart in their ministries. Uh, beginning in verse 10, Zechariah chapter 2. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Uh, this is twofold. It talks about the first coming of Christ. It talks also about the second coming of Christ. It speaks to both because of the details Let's just read this through, and then I'll go back and we'll do the supporting scriptures. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, that thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Sing and rejoice. Let's go back to Zephaniah. It comes right after Habakkuk. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3. He's talking about the restoration of Israel. The restoration that he describes is not the return. Good morning, Mark. It's not the return from Babylon, from the captivity of Babylon. It's not the return of the days of Zechariah and Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah and Joshua, Zerubbabel. It's not that return of which these verses speak. Because the scripture sets the context. We don't come up with a meaning on our own. The scripture tells us what it means. Verse 14, Zephaniah chapter 3, written 300 years before the Babylonian return to Judah. Sing, O daughter of Zion. This is what, <clears throat> this is what uh, Zechariah was quoting. And he said, well, just because he quoted that, that means that he is the fulfillment of that return. No, because Zechariah, as we shall see, speaks of another time as well. A time that did not come to pass during his day. Now, verse 14 of Zephaniah, chapter 3. Sing, O daughter Zion, 
Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. It looks like Hamas is still there. Looks like Hezbollah is still raining down missiles. Look like ISIS in Syria is still pounding them. Looks like the, the rebels in, in Yemen are still pounding them. <laughs> Look like Iran's still fighting them. That hadn't happened yet. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments and hath cast out thine enemy. This talks a place where Israel lives in the land in faith, not without faith. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee, is he? Does Jesus sit on the throne of his father David in uh, Jerusalem? No, that hasn't happened yet. That won't happen until after the great tribulation and Christ sets up his kingdom here on earth. It will be a literal, physical, 1,000-year kingdom with Christ reigning on the throne of his father David. And the law shall go forth from Mount Zion. He shall rule with a rod of iron. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt see evil no more. Well, he's not talking about his first coming because we see evil. We're not talking about the Babylonian captivity's return under Zechariah and all those guys because evil is still in the land. There was still evil there during Jesus' day. There was evil when Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. There is evil there now because they do not trust the Lord their God. They have not come to Christ. They are in the land in unbelief, exactly as the scripture says they would be here in the last days. God has brought them back. There is a future for Israel. He will save a remnant of them alive. They will start the kingdom, the millennial kingdom of flesh and blood, a restoration of Eden here on this earth. And there will be peace because the Lord Christ himself, the King of kings and Lord of lords will enforce that peace. And we shall rule with him as kings and priests. Hallelujah. Can you dig it? I can dig it, man. But they're seeing evil today. See, that day hadn't come yet. Zephaniah is writing about the second coming and the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth. In that day, verse 16, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hand be slack. Nobody can tell Israel not to worry right now. Nobody can tell Israel not to fear, even though the Lord is protecting them. We just we just studied the other day about how he is a wall of fire around them. Good afternoon, Kevin. God bless you. Good old Kevin Kelly. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he is. But one day he'll be present and they'll all see him. They'll see King Jesus sitting on the throne. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Time hadn't come yet. The land is not at peace. The Lord doth not reign yet, but he will. He will. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly. Who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. That's the remnant. During the great tribulation, God will preserve a remnant. One third of the Jews who are alive on the earth at time will be saved when about two thirds of the people on the earth will be killed. Two thirds of the Jews will be lost during that time, however many there are. If it happened today, you would have 12 million dead and 6 million saved. There's about 18 million Jews in the world. The majority of them, just barely, a little over 9 million living in Israel now because they're moving in every day. Don't forget this. If you're a Jew and you happen to be watching this program, go home. I don't care where you live. You need to move to Israel because Israel is the only safe place for a Jew right now. But what's even better than that, what you should do before you go is to surrender to Jesus Christ. Recognize him as your Messiah now 
and avoid the great tribulation. And I say that not just to Jews, but I say that to everybody. That is the message. That is the only message that I have. Jesus is coming soon. You need to be ready. The rapture could happen at any minute. You need to be ready to go. You need to live each day like he's going to come that night. Because one night he will. I believe it's night because he says at the midnight cry that he'll come. The bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. You need to be ready. You need to have oil in your lamp. That means you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to do it today. Confess your sin to Jesus. Repent of your sin. Commit your life to him. Believe that he was crucified for your sins, that he suffered and died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose the third day to give us eternal life. That He's alive then, he's alive now, he's alive forevermore, and he can and will save you if you ask him to, and he is the only one who can save. Buddha can't save you, Allah can't save you, the Hindus can't save you, Confucius can't save you, the Pope can't save you. Nobody can save you but the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All other gods are devils. Satan runs it all from hell. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's in charge of all religion. All religion goes against Christ. Religion killed Jesus. Religion put him up on the cross. Religion murdered him. Of course, that's what it looks like to everybody else. But he says, I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it up again. This command that I received from my father. The Romans and the Jews and the, the Gentiles involved, they didn't kill him. No, he, he laid down his life. When he was on the cross, he could have called 10,000 angels. Seven legions of angels. Six legions of angels. He could have had as many angels as he wanted. I think six legions of angels would be would be uh, 72,000 angels. <laughs> he could have had them come and pull him down off the cross, but he said, for this hour I was born. They didn't kill Jesus. He gave up the ghost. He died. He decided to die at the exact point that he died. They didn't kill him. They could have done anything to him and not killed him. Because he never quit being a hundred percent God. And he never quit being a hundred percent man. So he laid down his life and he had the power to take it up again. And he did. Everybody else is a phony. Every other religion is false. There is no religion in Christianity. Only your relationship, your born again, blood bought relationship with the God who lives forever revealed in the pages of the Holy Scriptures as the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, Charlie, or afternoon. Born in a manger, never sinned, fulfilled the law, laid down his life, rose again the third day, and he's coming again to judge the quick and the dead. It's better that he judge you now than judge you then, because if he judges you then, you'll go to hell. Accept him now. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. He said, you will find me in a time accepted. Now is the accepted time. Now, not later. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth and gather her that was driven out. It's going to bring everybody back to Jerusalem. A third of the Jews still alive, that he will supernaturally protect in what is now Jordan. Back then it was Ammon. Because he comes from Basra with his garments dripped in blood from the battle of Armageddon, Isaiah chapter 63. And they recognize him, Zechariah. We'll get there later in Zechariah and they'll say, what are those wounds in your hands? They will, it says, they will look upon him who they pierced. And they'll say, what are those wounds in thy hands? And he'll say, 
These are the wounds which I was with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And they will know that the guy that they thought was the son of the carpenter and Mary is actually their Messiah, and they will accept him and worship them. Six million Jews on the same day. I find it weird that that's the same number of Jews that Hitler killed in the Holocaust at a minimum, at a bare minimum. You know, so, well, we don't care about numbers. God cares about numbers. He said he'll save a remnant. He'll save a third of them alive during the Great Tribulation. He's going to bring them all back. I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. Every Jew everywhere in the world will come home. They'll be protected supernaturally. They will be in a new kingdom with the Lord Jesus. They will all accept Christ the same way that you did, the same way that I did. There's not a different means of salvation for them. He preserves a remnant so that they can be saved when Jesus comes back, when they see him and understand who he is. What are these wounds in thy hands? It's where you nailed me to the cross, Jesus says, and then they will understand. It says that they will weep as a man weepeth for his only son. They'll come to him and they'll love him. They'll come to him just like you and I did. Good, good afternoon, Deborah. At that time will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. And I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. When I have turned back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. That's not the return from the Babylonian captivity. That is Jesus, the Christ, revealing himself to Israel directly after the battle of Armageddon when his garments are sealed drenched in blood from that great slaughter of all the armies gathered against him. They won't stand a chance. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O Lord. Those are Jesus' last words before he left heaven to come to be born in a manger, to have flesh wrapped around him. Good afternoon, Steve. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It's written of me. He turns around to everybody in heaven. He says, boys, I'll be back pretty soon. Don't worry about it. I'm going to fix everything. And then he enters into human flesh. It's Isaiah. No, 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 no. Not Isaiah. What am I thinking? It is Psalm chapter 40, verse 7. It's quoted by Paul in his letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, beginning in verse 5. Lo, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And that body was in the womb of Mary. He was a hundred percent God. He was a hundred percent man. He never quit being either one. Lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Makes me think about John 1. Where he says, he says that he came unto his not he came he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, that's me and you, brother and sister, as many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God. And then in the next skip a verse then in the next verse it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us that's the Lord Jesus Christ it's the only son of the only God there ever was or ever will be and he wants to save you after he saves you he wants you to live a victorious life over the world the flesh and the devil 
I'm sure you know that if you've been listening to me any length of time at all. <laughs> Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Well, yes. When he sets up his kingdom, the remnant of Israel is saved. A handful of people who escaped the sword of the Antichrist, the guillotine, they'll probably be there too if they were lucky enough to hide somewhere. Of course, the Antichrist is going to be able to kill him. The scripture tells us that he will cause all that will not worship the beast to be put to death. In Revelation 20, verse 4, we find out that they were beheaded. So the guillotine is going to come back into play. It's a fascinating tool of execution. If you ever seen anybody's head cut off, it's really, really terrible. It just, uh, I would almost rather get killed any other way than to have my head cut off. I think that's why the, the, the Islam does uh, executes Christians that way by cutting off their heads because it's like, it's so final, you know, you can't sew it back on or anything. <laughs> but they were beheaded. But there's going to be a remnant. And many nations are going to straggle back you know, Jesus destroys the armies of the Antichrist that are gathered against, against him. That's nearly all the armies of the world, but there's going to be people here and there, and that's where the sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25 come in. And they're going to be judged on the way they treated Israel during the Great Tribulation. That's what the sheep and goat judgment is all about. It's not for saved people. I was judged at the foot of the cross. I shall never be judged again for my sin. I was judged one time at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. When he forgave me, I'm forgiven forever. He forgave every sin I committed, every sin I was going to commit, every sin I'll commit today, every sin I'll commit the day before I die. It is forgiven. It is bought and paid for at Calvary. Every sin. Jesus either paid it all or he didn't pay nothing. He either forgave all or he didn't forgive nothing. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Hallelujah. Do you want a savior that can only save a little bit or do you want, want one that Paul says can save to the uttermost? Because he can save to the uttermost. He had to do that to save me because my utter was most. <laughs> now, you are forgiven for everything and you're forgiven for nothing. And if you're forgiven for nothing, you just may as well go have a party or something because you can't believe any of it. Jesus says he died for the sins of the world. That's all of them. Every one of them. Every one of our sins he died for. I'll never be judged again as a sinner. Now, I will be judged uh, now in this life as a son. Because now that I belong to God, now that, that I have been adopted into the family of God by the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross, then uh, he's going to judge me as a son. If I get out of line, he's going to whack me. If I sin, he's going to punish me. But here on this earth, it has nothing to do with my salvation. Because when we sin on the earth, we drag the debris of our sin along behind us, just like Marley's chains in the Christmas carol. You know, when he came to visit Ebenezer Scrooge on that Christmas Eve, he was the first visitor, and he had all his sins dragging along behind him, all those money boxes and chains and everything. Well, we drag our sins behind us. You can divorce your wife and run off with another gal, and, but you don't, you know, you don't have a new family. You just got two families. Adam, God bless you. I'm glad you're watching. I'm not, maybe I hit you on your lunch break. That's great. Um, <laughs> you see, let's put it like this. I've used this before and it seems to suffice. If I get drunk and run off with a piano player and uh, 
for a wild weekend and wreck my truck and break my leg, will God forgive me? Yes, Velda might not, but God will forgive me. I will be forgiven. I don't have to go to hell. He's already judged me for my sin. But see, the, the consequences of my sin will remain here on the earth. I'll have to pay for what I do here on the earth. But not in heaven. It won't mean anything. You see, God forgives me. But my truck is still broke. My marriage is in trouble. And my leg is still broke. My truck is still wrecked. See, all the, all the damage is done. He doesn't miraculously set everything back to zero so you can start over again. And so he chastises us through our lives for the wrong that we do. But in heaven, it doesn't mean anything. Now, I am being ju I was judged as a sinner. Never be judged as a sinner again. From the time I got saved until the time I die, I'm judged as a son and either punished or rewarded accordingly. There will come a day when I stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. They will come when we must all stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That is the Bema judgment. We will stand there for either reward or reprimand. Now, what he will do is he will judge me as a servant at that point. What did I do? with the gifts that he gave me and carrying out the work that he gave me to do. And I will be rewarded for my service. Plain and simple. It's not a decision of whether I get to go to heaven or not. That was made at the foot of the cross a long time ago. Like Johnny Cash song. The old account was settled long ago. The old account was settled at the foot of the cross. And there's room at the cross for you. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. And there's room at the cross for you. And many nations shall be joined unto the Lord in that day and shall be my people. See, we talked about the Jews, the remnant. We talked about the people who escaped the Antichrist. And then we talked about some of these people from different countries that were not in the army facing them at the end after the sheep and goat judgment. Uh, one thing that surprises me, and it still surprises me all the time, but it's what the Bible teaches. There was no greater enemy in the early days of Israel than Egypt and Assyria. Egypt, uh, Assyria, Egypt was the, 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 the second great world empire after the Sumerian Empire, which was really Babylon, the Tower of Babel. Then the Egyptians fought, the Assyrians followed the Egyptians for world power. And they were before the Babylonians. But there's going to come a day there's going to come a day where, where, where Egypt is going to be called uh, and, and Assyria. Now, I know this is, this is hard to believe, but in chapter 19, and this had never happened. This has never happened yet. This is all for the future. This is going to be during the kingdom age when Christ reigns. It says here that, Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. What a deal, huh? Here's an example of that. I don't have time to read you every example, but here's an example of that. Chapter 19 of Isaiah, verse 18. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan. Hebrew and swear to the Lord of hosts one shall be called the city of destruction in that day or they would call it also perhaps the city of the sun because they were sun worshipers. remember Ra and, and, and Osiris and Isis and all that 
In that day, there should be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And so this is the Lord's altar. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Israel and land of Egypt, Egypt, for they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. You see, the Antichrist in the beast system, he doesn't just control Israel. He controls the whole world until a lot of the world goes against him. And then finally, Jesus Christ himself destroys him. It says, and it shall be a sign and for a witness under the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. So they, they shall cry unto the Lord because of their oppressors. Things get so bad that these heathens start calling upon the Lord and he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them. Who's the only savior there is? His name means savior, Jesus, Joshua, deliverer, Yeshua, Mashiach, the Messiah. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, the Lord. And the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. Can you believe it? And shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow, vow unto the Lord and perform it. They're going to say, we're going to follow the Lord. We've been worshiping idols. We're going to follow the Lord. We worship the beast until he nearly destroyed us. We're going to, the Antichrist, but we're going to worship the Lord. And the Lord shall smite Egypt and he shall smite and heal it. Let's see. Isn't that great? And they shall return even to the Lord. That's verse 22. And he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. Egypt. He told the children of Israel, don't go back there. Don't ever go back there again. Don't have anything to do with Egypt. It represents sin. It gets better. Verse 23, chapter 19, Isaiah. And that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And that's north and west of Babylon. Their capital was Nineveh. That's where Jonah went to, to prophesy. And that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria and the Egyptians shall serve with the Syrians. They were enemies for world domination. Now it gets better. Verse 24, in that day shall Israel be a third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. See, God is going to make these enemies of each other and of Israel part of his people. If you never read the Old Testament, you never learn about this stuff. Look at here. Verse 25. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. He gave the land to Abraham. But at some point in time, he gave Egypt the power. And if it had not been for the power of Egypt in the days of Joseph, there wouldn't have been any Israel because they'd all died. See, God's always making provision. And he says that Assyria is the work of his hands. He said, I, I built up Assyria. I built them up possibly just so that they could destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, whose capital was Samaria because of the works of Jeroboam and Ahab and Jezebel. But one day he's going to call many nations into that kingdom. It's going to be a real kingdom. It's going to be here on the earth. Hello, Chris and or Julie. If y'all are together today, maybe I'm seeing both of you. Good afternoon. I mean, I started a little late. It said, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Who did he send? Jesus. What did he tell his disciples? As my father hath sent me, 
so send I you. That's what he told his disciples. And also in John 17, in his high priestly prayer, which, as you know, I think ought to be called the Lord's Prayer, and because the Lord's Prayer is really the disciples' prayer. Verse 3 of chapter 17, when he's praying, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That is the sent one that he's talking about here. They shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And that day he shall be revealed, you see. That's what the revelation is all about. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion of the Holy Land. He shall choose Israel again, choose Jerusalem again. They're going to get it all back, the, the, the promises of Abraham. That's what the kingdom's all about. God promised the land to Israel. They will have the land, but it goes beyond that. It is the kingdom of Jesus Christ on the earth for a thousand years. A lot of people say, well, it's not really a thousand years. It's, it could be any amount of time. No. Now, in eight verses, it says a thousand years in chapter 20 of Revelation. If it meant some other time, they would have said it. If he meant 22 years, he would have said 22 years. It's a thousand years. Be silent. O oh, all flesh before the Lord. It kind of reminds me, be still and know that I'm God. But it also, it also reminds me of Habakkuk. Uh, I think he's right before Zephaniah. Um, oh, yeah. He's talking about idols. Habakkuk chapter 3, beginning of verse 18. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image, and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? It's like, I made this thing, and now I'm going to worship it. How weird is that? Woe unto him that saith to wood, Awake to the dumb stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But, verse 20, chapter 2 of Habakkuk. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. Keep silence before him. Or be silent, all the earth before him. In Zephaniah, he says, verse 7, chapter 1 is Zephaniah. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid his guests. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Uh, there are many things here that, uh, that we could go into, but I think it's just pertinent to know that there's going to come a day when the kingdom will be set up in Jerusalem. All Israel shall be saved, just like Paul said, all the ones that are left alive. So it's, it's incumbent on us to talk to our Jewish friends whenever we can and, and to press the claims of Christ because they have no guarantee that they would be in this remnant. We don't know whether the rapture is going to happen tomorrow or a hundred years from now. I believe it's going to happen soon. I believe it's going to happen very soon. But I could be wrong. I, 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 I'm not infallible. All I have, I don't have any more information than you do. No, I just have the information that's available to everybody. I do have the Spirit of God living inside me. 
I do have the direction of that spirit in my study and in my prayers because I've devoted the end of my life here to prayer and to the ministry of the word, just like the apostles did. Possibly because that's about all I can do anymore. I'm too old and crippled up to do much else. Become a soul winner and live a holy life. Jesus could come tonight. You need to be ready. We'll get back on this again tomorrow.